Hello. There we go. <laughs> well, good morning, Liberty family. It's good to be back in the pulpit. Glory to Jesus. We took um, a vacation and then came back and we got to hear um, Barry McGuire talk about sharing our faith and the supernatural things that happen when we do. By the way, if you didn't get one of these cards or some of these cards, they're in the lobby. You can pick them up. They're a great tool that you can use. There's a QR code on them that they can scan if you uh, are witnessing to somebody and they want to know more. They can scan this. It'll walk them through the entire presentation of the gospel, and it'll culminate with the, the sinner's prayer. And then the service times of liberty are on the back, so it's a great invitation card as well. So I encourage you to, to uh, grab a hold of those if you haven't already uh, gotten some of those. It'll be a great tool in your toolbox. Amen? Well, we're in a summer series entitled I Choose To, and we've looked at I Choose to Grow, I Choose to Forgive, I Choose to Surrender to God's Plan for My Life, and I Choose to Fight the Good Fight of Faith. And then last week, Barry McGuire talked about I Choose to Share My Faith, and today we want to talk about I Choose to Serve God's Purpose in My Local Church. Why should we serve in our local church? Well, the gospel is enacted through the local church all across the world. The one thing that Jesus made a declaration regarding, the one agency, institution, that he himself said that he was personally going to build is the local church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Uh, right now, you know, there's a lot of concern by, uh, by uh, church statisticians that the church is in decline in America, that um, churches are closing, and certainly all of that is true, especially uh, in a post-COVID world. We, we've definitely seen a challenge there with People uh, just staying at home and watching online rather than uh, becoming part of a church. But I'm here to tell you that uh, one thing that was good that came out of COVID is that Jesus himself said in John chapter 15, he says, every branch that does not bear fruit, I will cut it off. And every branch that is fruitful, I will prune it. And there has been a pruning so that God can make his church holy, that God, and we're seeing that in the news on a regular basis with ministers falling here and there and, and uh, all this controversy within the church. But here's the thing that I know. God always has a remnant. Even in countries where the church is being persecuted, the church flourishes underground. And God always has a remnant because Jesus said, I will personally build my ecclesia and hell itself can't stop it. And so it doesn't matter what the statisticians are saying. We are just now being positioned by the Holy Spirit for an outpouring of God's Spirit. And so you can look at the glasses either half empty and, uh, and you can be negative and say it's going to be empty by the end of the uh, year or next year or decade. Or you could say it's just half full. And now we're in a position because God is purifying his church and he's positioning us for a revival. And I choose to believe the latter. God is positioning us for a move of God, for revival. The church has a twofold purpose and I want to focus in on one of those purposes. We've taught a lot about the purpose of the ecclesia. The Greek word ecclesia is, is where we get the English word church. And uh, the, the best way to understand uh, the time when Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia, 
Uh, he didn't choose a religious term. That was a secular term used to describe an institution. When Rome would go in and conquer a region, they would set up an ecclesia, and through the ecclesia, they would bring legislation, they would bring the culture of Rome, and they would um, uh, invade that territory through the ecclesia and transform that region. Well, Jesus said, I'll build my ecclesia. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to purchase the territory with my blood, and then I'm going to raise up an ecclesia that will bring my culture, my laws, my rule, my kingdom in each region. And he does that through local churches scattered all across the world. Thank God that Jesus is building his church and not man. Amen? Amen. That's a good place to say amen right there because Jesus is the one committed to building it and he is building it. But there's another side of the local church. There's, a, there's another thing that I want to talk about. In fact, what I'm going to share with you today, I've been a pastor for, uh, past, full-time pastor for 44 years and uh, I've never shared what I'm going to share with you today because frankly, I just didn't see it the way I see it today. <clears throat> and I'm going to open my heart and share with you uh, what I believe is the second purpose of the local church, and it has to do with you personally. The local church is God's agency that he has chosen through which he will uh, grow his body and make the body a transformative force in the earth. It is the church, the ecclesia. The, the raw meaning of ecclesia means those who have been called out and called together. And so you're not an ecclesia sitting at home by yourself. That's not an ecclesia. When you gather together with God's people, you form an ecclesia. That's the word we call church. We form what is known as the church. And the church does not have its power until it gathers together. Same, likewise, we don't have the power we're supposed to have until we gather and become the agency that Jesus is building, the church, the ecclesia. And so there's a twofold purpose, and that second fold has to do with your own spiritual growth, but also it is the agency through which God has ordained that you would discover your spiritual gifts and your spiritual purpose here on the earth. It is through the local church that God has ordained this. And I know there's a lot of people that uh, struggle with the idea of being part of the local church. The new thing today is, you know, I can just be online, have online church. Uh, but here's the, here's the problem with the whole online church mentality. Yes, we should be, on on, we should be online, but not as a substitute for being the church. Because the scripture says that we're, there are 100 verses in the New Testament that command us to serve one another, help one another, and minister to one another. And it's very difficult to do that online. In fact, there are some things that you can only receive through the laying on of hands. And I can't uh, electronically lay hands on you. I can try, but it doesn't work. I can't uh, do it even through letter. Paul, in Romans chapter 1, he said, I long to be with you so that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. There is an impartation. Hebrews chapter 6 calls it the doctrine of laying on of hands. There is a doctrine of the church that is taught in the New Testament called the laying on of hands. He said that to, uh, Paul said to Timothy that you are to stir up the gifts that are in you that were given to you through the laying on of the hands of the local presbytery. In other words, a spiritual gift was imparted to you, Timothy, when hands were laid on you. And so he says, stir up those gifts. So there's an impartation that only occurs through the laying on of hands. Uh, he also said, is there any uh, uh, sick among you? Let him call for the, what, elders of the church and let them pray over you and anoint you with oil. Okay, the word anoint means to rub your forehead, to anoint you with oil, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. And then there's the great commission. Jesus said, these signs will follow those who believe and one of the signs, he says, they will lay hands, hands on the sick, and they shall recover. 
And so there's no substitute for the doctrine of laying on of hands. In fact, in theological uh, seminaries, it's called the, uh, the, the, uh, co- the law of contact and transmission. It, it's you lay your hands on somebody because Jesus said this is how it works. And then there is the transferring of the power of the Holy Spirit through that individual into that other person. And when I'm done teaching today, you're going to understand why that's the case, okay? And and it's a very important aspect of your growth spiritually. You can't reach maturity without it. We need each other. God designed us to need each other. It's not an option. It's not, um, you know, well, I'll go to church if I feel like it. No, we need each other. I need to go to church so that I can be a blessing and I can also grow. And that is God's avenue for spiritual growth. It's his avenue for discovering your gifts. Uh, You have spiritual gifts. When you get born again, uh, God puts gifts, spiritual gifts in you. There are gifts and talents he puts in you at birth. Psalms 139 tells us that when we're in our mother's womb, God is fashioning you. He's ordaining all the days of your life. He has, he has a, a purpose, a plan predestined for you. In fact, Ephesians 2, verse 10, uh, we are his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, the Amplified Bible says, so that we may do those good works which God has predestined, planned beforehand, And then I love this part. He says he has not only planned them beforehand, but he made them ready for us to live, uh, to to do living the good life that he has prearranged. So there is a good life that God has prearranged for you. And you can only be in that good life if you're using the gifts that God has called you at, at, called and given to you and doing what God has told you to do, God has created you to do. And all of that is discovered and unfolded through the local church. Uh, and so this is why it is so important. It's more than just, you know, I'm, I'm babysitting children in the nursery or I'm greeting somebody at the door, you know, like I'm a Walmart greeter. You know, that's fine, but there's... It's not that way in the church, you see, because in the church, uh, we carry spiritual gifts. I was at a church when I was in Bible school, and a person was, uh, came into the church with, with a, um, a, a messed up back, and, and the ushers and the greeters had gathered before service and prayed that when, when they greeted people today, that miracles would be released. Well, this person came into church and testified that when the greeter grabbed them and hugged them and shook their hand, they were instantly healed by the power of God. Okay, well, that, that is more than just being a greeter. That is, uh, that is being a minister, okay? There's a huge difference. Ushering in God's presence. It's more than just being an usher at a movie theater. Okay? Those ushers could care less about you. They're just doing their job and they're just shining the light and they're telling you where to go and and what to do here. But we usher in God's presence because we carry his presence. We carry his gifts. We have spiritual gifts deposited on the inside of us. So it is greater than just uh, the carnal, natural things that we see. It is becoming the church so that we can be all that God created us to be, a formidable force that transforms our community. So this is how we grow spiritually. It's how we are, are listen, we are becoming the body of Christ in Solano County. Do you understand that? Every church that gathers, that believes in Jesus, when we gather, we are, we are maturing and becoming the body of Jesus. And the very Jesus that our, our, our community needs is embodied in the church. We're his body. We carry Jesus. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have this treasure hidden in earthen vessels And it's so that we can be a blessing to others and we can deposit those gifts and minister to others. So let me let me explain it to you from scripture. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4 
And uh, let's see what, what Peter has to say here. First Peter chapter 4, and he says, uh, the end of the world is coming soon. <laughs> it's like Peter wrote this last week, right? <laughs> it certainly feels like that. He says, the end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. This is why we prayed for our nation. He says, be disciplined in your prayers because prayer is hugely important. And he says, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. Why? Because the church is the agency that Jesus is embodying on the planet Earth. We represent, or let me say it this way, we represent Jesus. So he says, show deep love for each other. Love covers a multitude of sin. It's time for the church to really get a hold of this. We're not here to point out everybody's little sins because all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God, and there go I but for the grace of God. Hello. Love covers a multitude of sin. In other words, love has the answer, has the cure for a multitude of sin. Love never fails, hallelujah. He says, Cheerful, uh, care, cheerfully share your home with those who, who need a meal or, stay, or a place to stay. Now, the Amplified, the next verse says, Just as each one, just as each one of you has received a special gift, a spiritual talent, an ability graciously given by God, employ it. Employ what? Your special gift. Employ it in serving one another. There's one of those 100 one another's. Employ it in serving one another as is appropriate for good stewards of God's multifaceted grace. Faithfully, us using the diverse, varied gifts and abilities granted to Christians by God's unmerited favor. Now, that's a mouthful, but here's what he's saying. Every single one of you carry a grace gift on the inside of you. You carry God's grace. The Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace that so you could find help in the time of need. Here's the problem we forget. God distributes that grace through his body. We come to God, we ask for help, but he distributes that help through one another. We don't get it apart from each other. God's not going to just sovereignly do it without other people. He has chosen to use his body. And he has chosen that you must be dependent on one another. God set it up that way. Because he's raising a body not a bunch of individualisms. He's raising up a body that functions wholly, functions together to bring about his purpose. And then he goes on and explains, here's how some of this works. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as if God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Most do. Then do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. See, when you serve, you're bringing glory to God. When I serve the purpose of God by serving you, I'm actually glorifying God. He says, all glory and power forever to him forever and ever. Amen. So notice the phrase, multifaceted grace. The multifaceted of God's grace. God's grace is multifaceted. That means the many-sided grace. It's like a diamond. There are many sides, many reflections, many angles. And those cuts, those angles, those, they're called facets. And when a jeweler is making a diamond, he cuts those facets inside those, those different sides. And each facet has a different reflection. You reflect God and his grace differently than the person next to you and behind you. We are the multifaceted Grace of God being expressed in the earth. And he does it 
through the gifts of the Holy Spirit deposited on the inside of you. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he lists what we call the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I want to point out something in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, for through one is given, and he begins to list off nine different gifts. Through another, they receive. And so I want you to catch the phrase through, because you see, God uses each one of us to release his grace through us. It's the Holy Spirit flowing through us, okay? And there are three different categories these nine gifts are labeled in. And here they are. There are three revelation gifts, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. We all need knowledge, and we all need wisdom, and we certainly need discerning of spirits. And then there's the three power gifts, faith, gifts of healings, and workings of miracles. And if you don't need a miracle, praise God, but if you need a miracle, then you want that gift. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, he says, earnestly desire the best gifts and what is the best gift? The best gifts are the one you need. But he says, but love is the motivating factor for all the gifts operating in the body. Okay? And that's what 1 Corinthians 13 is about. So 12 is a list of the gifts. 13 is the motivation for the gifts, love. And then 14 is how they function in a local church setting. The do's and don'ts of spiritual gifts in a church environment. That's what that is. And then there are the three speaking gifts, speaking in tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. So through the revelation gifts, uh, God brings to light that which is hidden. We get special insight into the intention of God. Uh, then we have the three power gifts. They demonstrate God's power visibly. They convey God's grace visibly. And then we have the three speaking gifts, they communicate God's grace audibly. And so all of these gifts work together like, look at me if you would, like the different fingers on the hand. This little pinky, as little as it is, it is really strong. Try to grip without that, that little finger. It's hard to get a hard, a strong grip because you need that, all that muscle that is behind that little tiny pinky finger. And then, of course, you've got your ring finger, your middle finger, your index finger, your thumb. All of those work together to grasp, for the hand to work the way it does so that we could do intricate little things. You know, if it wasn't for the human hand, all of the uh, inventions that we enjoy and all the little things that require intricate work would never have been possible if God didn't create the dexterity of the hand. And so all of that works together to empower the body to use the hand its most effective way. Now, I have two feet, two legs, so I don't need to walk on my hands. But there are people who can walk on their hands, and it's pretty inefficient. Okay, I've seen them, and it's not very efficient. Your legs were designed to walk and run on. Okay? Your hands were, were designed to grasp, to work, to do detail. Okay, So we need every single little part of our human body to function properly, to be effective. And that's the analogy that the Apostle Paul uses through the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, in the exact same way the body works in the natural is how the spiritual body works in the spirit. When I need exhortation, I need to hear from someone's voice. When I need encouragement, I need to hear from someone's voice. I need the mouth of the body to help me. When I am in need of practical aid and assistance, I need the hands and the shoulders and the strength of the body to help me. 
And, and this, is, this is how the spiritual body of Christ functions and operates. And so God has designed every part of the body. In fact, he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, and also in, in Romans, uh, he says the same thing in Romans 12. He says, the individual members of the body cannot say, I don't need the other parts. The hand can't say to the mouth, I don't need you. The foot can't say to the torso, I don't need you. We need each and every functioning part. In fact, he goes on to say, and the parts that seemingly are insignificant. You know, <clears throat> when a doctor tells you, oh, that organ in your body is really not necessary, they're lying. They're lying. There's a reason they say they have a license to practice medicine. Okay? Because if God put that organ in your body, your body needs it. Now, some are more important than others, but he doesn't put anything in your body that's not necessary. That's an evolutionary comment is what that is. That's saying that evolution didn't quite figure it out that that little organ that we need to cut out of your body is really not necessary. No, you might be able to live without it, but it's necessary. It serves a purpose. Hello. I got one amen from the nurse on the front row. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> and that's not a slam against doctors. That is just a statement of fact. The body, every single part is necessary. You, likewise, he said, cannot say, I'm not needed. That's a lie. You are being deceived by an evolutionary thought. Because you are necessary and you are needed. That's why God put you in a body. Besides, in the Bible, the New Testament, I, I just, I'm going to break it down, make it real. The only people who didn't go to church were either unsaved or those under judgment. They called that excommunication because they were kicked out of church. Today, we excommunicate ourselves through disobedience. The, in, the, in the first century, they, they were excommunicated for disobedience by the elders. Today, we, ex, we excommunicate ourselves by saying, I'm not going to go to church, and I'm going to be under God's judgment for my disobedience of not dealing with offense. Just let that sink in for a moment. Because how many of you have ever heard anybody say, well, I'm not going to church, I got hurt at church? Anyone ever, anyone ever heard that? Yeah, every hand goes up. Because we live in a fallen world where people hurt each other. Besides, you ever got hurt at work? I did. Did you stop going to work? Yeah. No, you, because it's necessary. You needed that paycheck. Well, being part of a body is just as necessary. And, and so here's the cure. Really, I'm... I'm I'm trying to be as loving as I can, but as truthful as I can. We need one another. And if I've been hurt at church, the only reason I stay home is because I refuse to obey Jesus. He said, go to your brother and fix it. And I refuse to do that. So I'm in sin. So it's just easier when you're in sin to stay away from righteousness. It's easier to call them hypocrites when I'm the hypocrite. Yeah, because I think I'm perfect and they're not. Right? I mean, that, is this, am I breaking this down real enough? This is the truth. This is, this is what we need. Jesus said, go fix it between you and your brother. And if they won't hear you, bring another brother, bring another sister. And if they won't hear them, bring the church. Get the elders involved. Amen. Why? Because unity is the most important thing. Love is the most important issue. And if I cut myself off from the very thing that God uses to mature me, to meet my needs, to answer my prayers, I'm actually putting myself under judgment because I refuse to deal with my own sin of offense. 
The word offense, scandalizo, literally means to fall, to sin. I have been offended, meaning I have sinned. That's what it means. Jesus said, offenses will come, and when they do, go to your brother so you don't sin. Now, I didn't call your name out. Don't have to send me no letter. But in all seriousness, you know if God's speaking to you. Yeah. And if he is, then obey the Bible. Obey Jesus. Go get it right. Go to your brother. Go to your sister and say, we need to talk. Can we talk? And he says, win your brother over. Get it resolved. Why? Because you want to stay under the grace of God. And where is God's grace? It's in his body. It's in his body. See, I can stay at home and say, God, I need healing today. But God puts gifts of healings in the body. They're not in my bedroom. Now, I'm not saying God won't ever heal you in your bedroom, but, but you need to be connected to the body. Because his primary way of giving you his grace is through these multi-facets of grace gifts residing in his body. And one of those gifts is called gifts, plural, of healings, plural. In the Greek language, it's in the plural, meaning there are multiple gifts and there are multiple healings, and they're different gifts. So that means one person may have a gift of getting deaf ears open. Heidi Baker is really known for that. Like 90% of the people that are deaf that she prays for, God opens their ears. Reinhard Bonnke gets uh, uh, dead people raised and blinded eyes opened all across Africa, okay? Uh, I've never personally had God open anyone's blinded eyes. I've seen three blind people get healed, but I've not personally experienced God doing it through me. But I've seen God do it through others. And, and during the great healing revival that took place in the uh, 40s uh, through the 50s um, and this, into this, uh, the first part of the 60s, the, these healing evangelists got together. They formed a, like a magazine uh, to, to report all the testimonies and healings that God was doing. And they discovered that when they got together, that this evangelist would have like 80, 90% of the people who had back problems were healed, but nothing else. And this evangelist discovered that people who had blood disease got healed. And this evangelist discovered that people who were deaf got healed. And, this event, and they discovered what the Bible teaches all along, that there are different gifts plural, of healings, plural. And so those gifts are deposited in the body. I've come to church, and I have had people pray for me, and I got healed. When I prayed for myself, and nothing happened. I've come to church when I'm talking to people, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit begins to manifest in our conversation, and I get the very answer from God that I'm seeking. Have you ever ha had that happen? I know you have. I've watched people go, ooh, that was God. Ooh, did you feel that? That, that was the Lord speaking right there. What is that? It's a gift of knowledge, word of knowledge, or word of wisdom. And God is using that individual you're talking to to speak to you, to give you guidance, to give you wisdom. Why? Because he does that through his body. That's how he chose to give us his grace. We're, we're told to come to the throne of grace so we can get help, but the grace is distributed through the body. It's distributed through the body. I wish to God I would have seen this when I was in my early 20s and I was pastoring for the first time. I didn't understand this. To me, church was an optional thing. But I realize now in looking back and studying the scripture, I realize that God has chosen to give everything I need through his body. Through his body. 
So if you're battling with a sickness or a disease, have someone pray for you. If you're struggling with, um, you know, like problems, going through issues, James 5 says, if you're suffering, you should pray. And if you're sick, you should call the elders and let them anoint you with oil and let them pray for you. And so the body is God's chosen instrumentality to bring about the expression of his grace in our lives. Because everything we receive from God is a grace gift. But it doesn't just come out of the sky. It comes through his body, through the law of the laying on of hands. Paul, again, Paul said, I long to be with you so that I can impart to you some spiritual gift. He said to Timothy, stir up the gift that is in you, which was given to you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. There's an impartation. So this is the power of the local church. In the local church, you receive gifts. You discover your gifts. You become a minister of God's multifaceted grace gifts. And that's what happens in the church. Now, 1 Corinthians 12 is going to make more sense to you. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but it's the same spirit who is the source of them all. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Well, I don't need anybody to help me. I just need, I just, you know, I just trust God. Well, God is saying, great, you trust me, but I use my body. I use others. The very instrument you reject so if I don't understand that, I'll miss out on the answer to my prayer. You need God to move in your life. The best thing you can do is get around God's people. Go to church. Gather together with the saints. Talk to them. Have them pray with you. You'll be surprised. You'll be amazed at how Holy Spirit will manifest, and you'll get the very grace you are seeking. The Spirit, he, verse 9, or sorry, verse 8, the one the one person the Spirit gives up to one, the Spirit gives the ability to, to give wise advice. Through another, the same Spirit gives special message of knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another and someone else. The Spirit gives gifts of healings. There it is again in the plural. Plural gifts and plural different healings. He gives another, the person, uh, the, person the power to perform miracles and to another, the ability to prophesy. In Acts chapter 3, we have the story of Peter. I want you to get the picture. It says that he's going into the temple at the hour of prayer. And he goes by the gate called Beautiful. And it says there a crippled man was sitting begging for alms. Now, if you read down into the chapter and into the next chapter, chapter 4, you will discover this man's around 40, 42 years of age. And the Bible says that he sat there every single day. He was taken there by his friends where he sat and begged for alms every single day as people came into the temple. And one day, Peter walks by, Acts chapter 3, verse 6. And Peter says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now notice Peter says, what I do have, I give to you. What does Peter have? He has a gift of God's grace. So do you. The issue is what gift do you possess? You have one. But do you know it? And if you don't know it, you should go to Inside Liberty. Pastor Joan will help you unlock that. Seriously. That's something we're where we've started back up. And it says, when Peter reached down and he lifted the man up, he was instantly made whole. Now that's, we have two things going on here. We have a working of miracles because he works the miracle. He lifts the man up. And the Bible says his ankle bones receive strength. So there's a working of miracle here. And then he tells the Jewish leaders who were attacking him. I mean, can you, can you imagine Church leaders are upset because a crippled man got healed. And he says, this Jesus whom you crucified is the one 
who healed this man that was lame in front of all of you. And he did it through faith in his name and through the faith of him whom you crucified. Meaning that it was the gift of faith manifesting through Peter and the working of miracles that brought this miracle about. And Peter is saying that's what made this man whole. What if Peter had stayed home that day and said, I ain't going to church? I submit to you something that most people gloss right over, that he was left there by Jesus in his crippled state on purpose because of what happens in Acts 3 and Acts 4 when Peter heals the man. Because Jesus walked right by that crippled man every time he went into the temple. How do I know that? Because the Bible says in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4 as well that when he came back from the wilderness after being tempted by the devil, it says in Luke 4 that he returned in the power of the Spirit and he went into the temple as was his custom. And he opened to the book of the prophet Isaiah and he read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. He has anointed me. Okay, Jesus began to read from the messianic passage about himself. And as, but I want you to catch it says, he went into the temple as was his custom. Jesus went to church. And he went into the temple regularly. In fact, you remember the story when he was 12 years old? They couldn't find him. Uh, his mom and dad, they traveled down a couple of days and discovered we left our 12-year-old son somewhere. Where's Jesus? Right? You ever left your child somewhere? I have. Not very fun. <laughs> my, my son James is in service today, and I'm sorry, son, I didn't ask you for permission to tell this, but I left him at a appliance store. He was watching TV. And I was looking for, I don't know, dishwasher or something. I can't remember. And I drove home and Joan says, where's James? I'm like, oh. he's like eight years old or something, nine years old. I don't know. And, he <laughs> and so I rushed back and thank God he's still sitting there just watching TV. Like whew, he didn't even know I was gone. Hallelujah. <laughs> but it's, it's not a good feeling. So Mary and Joseph had that experience. They're like, where's, where's Jesus? Well, I don't know. I thought you were watching him. I thought you knew where he was. No, I thought you had him. And they go back, and he's in the temple asking the rabbis difficult questions. And they were amazed at him. So he is custom to going to church. He, he grew up in that. He knows that lifestyle. And yet he walks right by the crippled man every time he goes to church. Every time he goes into the temple. He walked right by the guy at the gate beautiful. So I submit to you that sometimes God has a timing for healings if it fits his purpose. In this case, this miracle proved the resurrection story of Jesus. And Peter used it to preach this message to these Jewish leaders that had Jesus crucified. I mean, if you read Acts 3, he's like saying, you did this, you killed him, you, you know, <laughs> and I can just see the conviction, because here's the power of God has demonstrated, in fact, the Bible says they were afraid because of the multitude saw the miracle. They were afraid to say anything against Peter about this. So they were very careful with their restrictions because they didn't want a riot on their hands. But here's my point. Peter carried a gift, a grace gift that got this man healed. Here's another one. The Bible, Jesus tells this story. He says that there is a widow, there's a severe famine is the word he used. Um, he said there's a severe famine in the land. And he said that a widow... Uh, of Zer in Zarephath, the region of Sidon, was about to die. But in the story that Jesus tells, he explains that this woman 
believes in the prophet. She, she is a believer. In fact, this is where he's talking about a prophet is not without honor except among his own relatives and how um, our, our uh, knowledge and interaction in the natural can get in the way of receiving something spiritual. And, and so he's explaining this and he says, but she was a believer, so God sent the prophet to the widow. Why? Because she's praying. She's going to eat her last meal, she tells the prophet, and then die, her and her, her, and her son. And, and so the prophet shows up, and a miraculous supernatural provision occurs through the instruction of the prophet. And my alarm is going off saying, I am out of time. Okay, let me, let me just land this plane, okay, and I'll let you go. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to jump out. All right. So, so the, God sends the prophet to this widow. Why? Jesus points this out. And it makes, again, the leader is really angry. He points it out. He sent the prophet because he was the instrument of God's grace to save this woman's life. God uses the body. And you carry grace gifts. You may even have a gift of healing and don't even know it. We had a lady that came to Liberty. I had a word of knowledge. I said, if you have a tumor, brain tumor, stand up. She stood up. She had a, an MRI, said she had an inoperable brain tumor. Some people gathered right here in the middle, prayed for her, and she went back to the doctor that next week, had a second MRI done, and the tumor was gone. She brought both records. She brought the, the neurology report and she brought the MRI report. And the brain tumor miraculously disappeared. And I didn't touch her or pray. Someone else did. Somebody sitting in that middle section has a gift of healing tumors and didn't even know it. I know that God uses me to heal knees and cartilage and knees. And I have like a huge success ratio uh, when I pray for people with that issue. Because I've just learned through the years, that's one of the things that God has given me a gift for. Okay, And so um, I, I share that because there are different gifts, plural, of healings, plural. So the different healings require different grace gifts. So it's okay if I have to be prayed for five or six times. Let me just say this lie that if you pray more than one time, you didn't pray in faith, it's a lie. Uh, because if I need a gift, Joan was in need of a, of a miraculous healing for migraines, and we were up in Seattle, Washington at a church, and Casey Treat was, was, um, was the pastor. He came up and did the transition and, and We've been, we were going up to his leadership conference 10 years in a row, and, and I've never seen him only move this way one time. He started moving in the, the word of knowledge, and he said, there's someone here, you've got these migraine headaches, boom, 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 boom. And we, we actually fasted and prayed for 30 days for Joan to be healed of these things. And we, over and over when she would get attacked, we would pray, and, if, and God would heal individual attacks, but we're like, let's get healed once and for all. Like, what is causing these? Let's, Lord, we need healing here. So she looked at me when he gave this word of knowledge, and I encouraged her, go on up there. She goes, well, it's almost gone. I said, go up there. And soon as Casey touched her, she said, I felt something like just lift off of me. And that infirmity just was like, boom. And she was really touched by the power of God and healed of those headaches, and that was the end of that plague. That was the end. And it came through a word of knowledge and responding to the word of knowledge. And then the guest speaker that was at this conference gets up and attacks what just happened. And I said, Joan, ignore this man. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's attacking a gift of the Holy Spirit, and he's actually on dangerous ground. And the next morning, Casey, when this guest was gone, he got up and corrected it and said, you know, that he disagreed with what happened. And, and so I share that because 
when the Holy Spirit is manifesting his gifts, it's never wrong, and it's for a purpose of releasing grace to his people. So I just want to sum this up by saying the phrase one another is found 100 times in the New Testament, 59 times it's in reference to your spiritual growth. And it's a reciprocal uh, understanding in the Greek language. And that's what happens when we pray for one another. Greek scholars tell us that this phrase, gifts of healings, plural, is not about a person being a healer because no one person is a healer. We call them faith healers today. That's not a biblical term, by the way. That's actually a secular humanistic term. Uh, Jesus was not a faith healer, and there are no faith healers. Holy Spirit is the healer, and he flows through his people, and he flows through gifts. And he, the, he says the Greek language is emphasizing that you will have a specific gift of healing that regularly flows through you. Meaning that you might have success in one area predominantly. And that's okay. When people need prayer for the area that you have a gift for, you should step up. You should say, I want to pray for you because God uses me to heal people with that condition. And don't be shy. Don't be timid about it because that's your gift. That's your contribution to the body. We need each other. He designed it that way. I don't have all the gifts. No pastor does. Only Jesus had all the gifts. He, the Bible says, had the Spirit without measure. We have the Spirit by measure. In other words, he chose to distribute these gifts throughout the body so that not one person is glorified. There is no other Messiah except Jesus. Only the Messiah has them all. You have a part. You have a part. She has a part. He has a part. We each have our part, and they're all different, and we need each other. And if we don't understand that, we miss the grace of God. We miss out on the wisdom we need. We miss out on the healing. We miss out on the provision of God. We've had people come to church, and I've heard the stories because eventually he's testimony. Yeah, you know, this stranger walked up to me and handed me $400. And I'm like, wow, praise God. Yeah, this member of Liberty did that. They said God told him to give me this money. Well, did you need it? Oh, man, yeah, I've been praying. This is what's going on. And God used somebody with the gift of giving to be a blessing to someone else. Well, you ain't going to get that gift if you sit home and watch online. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> excuse my, my English here, but that's just the way it works. I mean, we are a body, and we're called to function together. I need you. You need me. You need the person next to you. You need the person behind you. In fact, the answer to your prayer is sitting in this room. You just have to find out who has it. The healing that you need is sitting in this room. We just need to find out who it is. This is why we should pray for each other. I was telling our staff, I want to start pray, uh, encouraging the body to start praying for each other more. Why? Because of this reason, that's why. Because it releases our gifts, and people will start getting healed. The body will start, you'll start discovering, man, everybody I pray for that has tumors gets healed. So now when you hear someone, you know, so-and-so, you know, has a tumor, you, want to, you should jump up and say, I'm ready. Because you have that gift. Okay, and so whatever it might be, that's your part. That's your time to shine. That's how we grow. That's how the body. He ends with 1 Corinthians 4, 16 by saying that when the fivefold ministry equipping gifts do their part, the whole body then is equipped for ministry. And then it says, and as each part does its own share, it causes growth to the entire body. And we become a mature body of Christ. And it's a mature body that transforms a community. Did this help you today? Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for your word today. And I pray as people read their Bible that these scriptures will jump out at them. They'll see it at work right there in their own Bible. And Lord, I pray right now there will be a supernatural 
release in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Boy, thank you, Jesus. I hear the Lord say, I got a word. I got a word over here. I heard the Lord say, you're going through a transition, young lady. And God wants you to know he's got you. He's got you. That you don't worry is the word I hear the Lord say. Um, you do not have to worry about uh, what's going on because God is the one. God is the one who is directing your steps. And this season of transition, you're like you're in a fog right now, and I just see the Lord's going to cause the fog to blow away, and you're going to have real clarity here. The Lord just says, trust me, I've got you. I've got you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Woo. Wow. Okay, I don't know anything that's going on, but was that, yeah, you're crying. Was that right on? Yeah, I, I could tell. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> uh, Ryan, I heard the Lord say, I'm shifting some things in you, son, because it's going to be different than what you thought. And God says, just flow with that because it's a good thing. Amen. He's shifting some paradigms. And uh, it's good, though. <laughs> it's, it's real good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Woo! DeAndre, I heard the Holy Spirit say, Son, I have not changed my mind, nor have I forgotten what I told you. And I just hear the Lord say, It's time to re. The word I see is like restart, re refresh. It's like a reset in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for a reset of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. <clears throat> You're like, God, how am I going to do this? And the Lord says, it's not you, it's going to be me. Okay? Is that making any sense to you? Yeah? Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah? Okay. Woo! Well, this is fun. I love it when the prophetic starts to stir up. I can feel it stirring right now. Um, mm. Melisa, God says, daughter, um, <laughs> I've shown you some things, and, um, and you're, you're like, I can do that. But the Lord says, I want to do it through you. So let me show you a new way. So, Father, I just pray for a supernatural release in the name of Jesus. I pray for your wisdom and your guidance because you carry an anointing that is going to break yokes off of people. They're going to go, I don't know what just happened. And you're going to laugh and say, yeah, I do. In Jesus' name, Father, I just release. I call for that gift to be stirred in her in Jesus' name. There is a supernatural touch of God on your life for the supernatural, and God wants to relieve really, and praying about this. God wants to release that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Father. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right, Lord, let's just wait and see if he wants me to say anything else. For those of you who maybe aren't aware of what is happening here, there's in one of these gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 is called Word of Knowledge or Word of Wisdom. And it's where you, get a, you just get a word, and you don't know what it means to you. It doesn't mean anything, but to someone else, it means a lot. Um, it, it's, it's like um, God knows your language. He knows what you understand. <laughs> okay, like, like I'm in prayer, and I said, God, when so-and-so comes here, I want to hear about these prophecies that you have spoken over me because some of these are astronomical prophecies now i've never heard any preacher nor prophet or anyone ever use the word astronomical in church but this prophet comes here after i prayed that week in my bedroom by myself and he goes man i feel pastor richard i feel like there's there's I, what i'm hearing is these astronomical prophecies and i'm like i almost fell on the floor because he's speaking the language in my bedroom See, that's called a word of knowledge. He, 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 he's hearing what I said in my bedroom. Only God can do that. That's the Holy Spirit. That's gifts. That's, that's, that's what this is. 
Like I'm in the Philippines, and I said to this lady, the Lord, I was praying, God, I want to minister to her, and I see a butterfly, and I said, I know this is crazy, but I said, um, does a butterfly mean anything to you? Oh, my God, how did you know? I'm like, how did I know what? It's a butterfly. Okay, I don't know what. So she starts telling me what it means to her and what she's dealing with with her, her boyfriend. And she called her boyfriend a butterfly. And I said, what do you mean he's a butterfly? Like, I, I, okay, I grew up in church, okay. Even though I, I grew up in the hood, I, I, I wasn't in the hood. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I grew up in church. I'm a church boy. And I'm like, what do you mean butterfly? You know, like butterflies, they go from flower to flower, from girl to girl. I went, oh, but it opened the door for me to minister supernaturally to that person. That's called a word of knowledge. It do doesn't mean anything to the one who hears it, but it means everything to the one that God wants you to give it to. You, un you understand? And so you might have words of knowledge that flow through you. Some of you, like, like Bessie, as soon as I looked at you, I thought, Bessie prays words of knowledge. And God has given you prophetic insight. You're a prophetic intercessor, and you, pro you pray prophetically. Like, <laughs> I want to talk to you after the church, because I just saw some things that I, I see you praying, and I want to talk to you privately first about it. But I just, I just saw, like, you praying in your prayer closet. And, um, again, that is a word of knowledge, that is a, that's how the Holy Spirit is releasing grace, the grace of God, through you. Because remember, it's through one. You don't possess the gifts. They're not yours. He flows through you this way. And they're for other people. Okay? And, and so we need, to, in fact, this is why he said, desire earnestly spiritual gifts. Especially that you may prophesy. He said we have to desire them earnestly. Not just tolerate spiritual gifts. He said, pursue spiritual gifts and desire prophecy. You have to do it. Why? Why prophecy? Because it's inspired utterance giving you the mind and will of God. And we all need the mind and will of God. Amen? Yeah. So he says, pursue that. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you that you are leading us and guiding us into your truth. Bless your people today as we walk this out in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. If you need prayer, the prayer hall is open. God bless you. Were you blessed by the service today? Let us know in the comment section below. And while you're there, remember to like and subscribe. You can join us here live Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. or visit in person at 9 and 11 a.m. You can also join us in person every first Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for our nights of worship and every second, third, and fourth Wednesday night for corporate prayer. To stay up to date with everything happening here at Liberty, download the Liberty app. All right, we'll see you next week. Same, same time, same, same channel. channel.